This is the Paracave Podcast, proudly brought to you by major sponsor Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Parramatta Leagues Club, and co-sponsors Bo Cook from Loan Market, Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, BTZD Clothing, the official clothing partner of the Paracave Podcast, and the official media partner of the Paracave podcast, the Parramatta Times. Welcome to another episode of the Paracave Podcast. And now over to your host, Troy Warner, broadcasting live from the world-famous Paracave. And yes, hello and welcome back to another cracking episode of the Paracave Podcast. And Troy Warner here with another episode. This is the interview-style podcast that comes out once a week and with a former player or a current player uh, that plays, uh, well, this this episode is with a player who played in the NRL for the Canberra Raiders. He also played in the English Super League for the Cull Kingston Rovers. He represented his heritage country, Italy, in the World Cup and also Australia, the Australian Kangaroos in the World Cup. He also represented New South Wales in State of Origin, the mighty New South Wales Blues as well. He is the nephew of legendary... Australian Wallaby David Campisi. So by the sounds of that surname, you would now know that I am talking about Mr. Terry Campisi. Now, during the chat with Terry, we talk about playing for both here in the NRL and also the English Super League and representing both those nations as well, playing State of Origin. What he thinks about the game today, uh, Jared Croker, his great mate, and also some common league questions and the set of six personality questions as well. Now, just quickly, this would not be at all possible without the help and support of the sponsors who you heard at the top of the show. Major sponsor, Jack Pale Ale, exclusively available at Paramount Leagues Club. Bo Cook from Load Market, Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics, Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty, BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the Paracave podcast, and the Parramatta Times, the official media partner of the Paracave podcast. But more details about the sponsors and what they can offer you after the chat with Terry, so stay tuned for that one. Also, after the chat with Terry, some details about how you can get your hands on some Paracave podcast merchandise as well. But enough of me talking, you want to hear Terry and his rugby league story. So as Hindy says... Get a beer, coffee, whatever you want. Sit back, relax and enjoy and let's get straight into it. Good evening, guys. Terry Campisi, um, born in Queanbeyan, played for the Queanbeyan Blues as a junior in Queanbeyan Whites. Uh, at the age of 18, ditched Union and signed for Canberra Raiders. I was there from 2002, or well, the back end, so pre-season, and went over to Hull Kingston Rovers in the 2015 season. I was lucky enough to captain the club from 2010 after Alan Tung had retired, or I shared it with him uh, the first year. Lucky enough to play for Australia in the World Cup 2008, one game for New South Wales in 2009, a couple of Prime Minister games, played one game for country, um, yeah, and then when I come back from from England, uh, 2017, captain coach of Queen Blues for a uh, number of years and, until end of 2022, a couple of premierships there, and now playing for the Eden Tigers uh, with Adrian Pertell as the captain coach, so... Uh, still about four or five games left of the season and we're sitting in second. So, 
That's a little bit of a wrap up. And now I'm sitting with Troy from the Para Cave, uh, sitting on his podcast. And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Para Cave podcast is a former professional rugby league player with the Canberra Raiders and also the uh, Hull KR over in the English Super League. Also represented Australia and New South Wales, the Prime Minister's 13 and uh, New South Wales country and state of origin for the Mighty Blues as well. Welcome to the Para Cave podcast, Mr. Terry Campisi. G'day, thanks for having me on. Not a problem, thank you very much for joining me. Now, growing up, the nephew of the legendary David Campisi, who I had on the podcast a few years back now, um, were you always going to go down a rugby union path or a rugby league path? What what were you thinking growing up? Yeah, good question. I played both uh, growing up, so... Queemian White, which is the union team, and the Queemian Blues Rugby League, and... Um, Generally, I chose union over league uh, okay. when they fell on the same day, played representative you know, footy for union, uh, didn't play until schoolboys with rugby league. Um, yeah, it was, it was some pretty um, big shoes to, to follow uh, in, in David's. And when I started playing grade um, locally, I got a fair bit of stick. But at the end of the day, I was loving rugby league at the time when I got to, to that age where I had to make a decision and uh, chose the Mighty Raiders. Uh, straight out of school. What swayed you to that uh, decision of playing rugby league? Was it because of the the surname and playing rugby union, or you just wanted to play rugby league? Well, yeah, no, I was. Um, yeah, what was I playing in the schoolboys rugby union side and uh, playing local first grade for the Queen and Whites, and had a bit of a fall out with the coach, to be honest. Okay. And um, yeah. went across the the road to the Blues. They were trying to get me early on in the season, and. Mick Mantelli at the time was the coach, and and Ron Giddo. So um, yeah, when I when I had that falling out, I, I went over there, and yeah, the, the atmosphere and the uh, camaraderie with the with the Blues at that time was was awesome. Big Benny Cross was playing actually; okay. he was uh, yeah. in in the Blues side. So we this was uh, two thousand and two, when we won the competition, and then yeah, it was just loving my time in in the sport at, the, at that time uh, that had come to make a decision. So, um, yeah, I decided to go to the Raiders. So, uh, growing up, obviously, uh, Uncle David was a favourite player of yours in, in rugby union, but what about rugby league? Who were some of your – was there a team that you supported and who were some of your favourite players? Oh, it's hard to go past the Raiders. They yeah. were um, – yeah, they, they were the team to beat. Back then, they had representative players all across the the park. He had, uh, you know, Big Mao, Ricky Stewart, Laurie Daly, Brett Mullins, uh, Ruben Wiki. The list goes on. So, yep. um, very hard. And I was lucky enough. David had a relationship with with um, Sticky and a few of the players. So I'd go along to training sessions and um, meet meet the guys. So that was a that was an easy, um, you know, little fanboy time then but you know one player outside of the Raiders that that stuck out was uh Andrew Edenhausen actually okay. so yeah ET yeah um yeah good player and and all the girls loved him so <laughs> uh, everyone wanted to be ET yeah no nah, definitely great player represented many times for New South Wales and Australia uh you made your first grade debut against the Panthers uh unfortunately you lost that game 34-18 it was in Canberra what were your memories of that game? Was first grade everything you thought it was going to be like? Yes, yeah, so it was an interesting week. Um, I wasn't uh, originally, you know, in, in first grade to start the year. So 2003, we won the uh, reserve grade grand final. And then 2004, missed the starting side to, to kick the season off. And there was a few injuries. So Matt Elliott called me in and he had the... Uh, um, Penrith game up on the TV screen. And uh, there was Joe Nullivau and, and Frank Pulatula. A Tony Paul tour, sorry, as the back rollers, and they had the big frizzy hair back then. Yeah, and the they, hair won, they won the they won the comp the previous year. So um, yeah, she sat me down. He just said, "How would you like to be playing against these two big fellas this weekend?" And um, yeah, excitement. So it was it was a pretty good feeling. And obviously, growing up in Queanbeyan, which is only you know fifteen minutes away from the Canberra Stadium, I've um, got all my friends and family and everyone who's supported um, my career over over their time. It was just an awesome atmosphere and, you know, obviously we never won, but, yeah, really good feeling to play in front of all your, all your fans and your, and your family. So how did you go with uh, Tony and, and Joe? Did they, they run at you during that game, being the new kid on the block? <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, you had to, to make a few tackles. I was actually yeah, quite 
um, yeah, quite a heavy tackler in the game. I'd get in, involved a fair bit. I was never known to to smash blokes, but I'd probably be that third man in to get the stats up. But um, yeah, there was quite a few times that they they ran at me, and I think that we're in the game for quite a while, and we probably had an opportunity to go to the lead. And I think it was Mark McClendon at the time might have dropped the ball um, over the line or before the line. So um, yeah, some some key moments like in every football game, yeah. but. Yeah, one that um, you know I love these stories that yeah you know, that you're sitting here on a podcast talking about it. Otherwise, you you know you don't really get to talk about them too often. Yeah, no, that's it. That's it. Now you played a few games that season and the next one, but 2006 you suffered an injury um, and you were out for most of the season or all the season. Uh, first of all, what was the injury and how was that mentally on yourself just coming into grade first grade? Yeah, so I was battling with just that with a hammy injury um so i tore it um where did i tear it i think against bulldogs maybe and then yeah every time i, I kept trying to come back from uh, recovery i just kept re-tearing it so i was out for about 12 to 14 weeks all up so yeah um missed that season or the, the, the remainder of it, i think i think i came back at the end of the year okay. to play but um yeah, it was one that was just annoying because um, everyone knows hammies and calves, just you need to get them 100% right. So it was just uh, that niggling one that wouldn't go away. So just frustrating that you couldn't get back on the park and uh, especially, as I said, you just started making your uh, place in first grade. Yeah, it's always frustrating sitting on the sidelines. You want to be out there and contribute into the, to the squad. So, um, yeah, definitely tough and I've definitely had some of those frustrating moments over my uh, time. Well, 2008 was a, a great season for yourself and you really cemented your spot there at 5'8". Um, you also represented Australia in the World Cup in 2008. Uh, what was it like representing Australia? Yeah, it was, um, I was only talking about this last week actually at a sportsman's okay. dinner. Um, yeah, big Joel Monaghan, one of my good yep. mates, is um, yeah, godfather of, of my firstborn. So he um, was lucky enough to be named in the squad also that uh, that year. And we we're, were both driving around. It was uh, the off season for footy. We were driving around Canberra and we both got the phone call at the same time. So oh, nice. it was a pretty amazing moment. And um, we put our um, family on loudspeaker and we told, you know, we told his family and my family. Uh, while we're both sitting in the car and just, um, I can still get those goosebumps now thinking about it, the the uh, emotion and the happiness from, you know, my mum in particular and, and his old man was, um, yeah, something that I'll remember forever. Now, the, the game was against PNG, the, the mad country for rugby league. Uh, what was it like playing against them and uh, that moment lining up for Australia, singing the national anthem? Yeah, it was a... Uh, and look back at the squad now. There was some unbelievable players I got to to play alongside. So yeah, Darren Lockyer, Jonathan Thurston, Cameron Smith, Billy Slater, Israel Folau, Greg Inglis. Just to be in their presence, um, I learned a lot in that campaign. And yeah, I was <laughs> injury hit once again. Um, only I think I played sixteen or seventeen minutes. I got a bit of a blow to the to the eye and um, was no longer allowed to play in the rest of the the tournament. But um, yeah, it's same again. One that I'll remember forever putting on that, you know, Australian jumper that it's uh, every kid's dream. Yeah, definitely. Well, in 2017, uh, you have Italian heritage as well. So you represented Italy at the at the World Cup under uh, Cameron Serraldo. Um What was Cameron like as a, as a coach? We see him now, the head coach of the Bulldogs. Could you see then that he was going to become a, a head coach one day in the NRL? Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, you take... Little pointers, like I'm, I'm in the coaching game now, so you take little pointers from all the coaches that you coached by in the past, and there's definitely some um, some drills and some some way that he uh, um, he addressed the football team. Um, yeah, he, he spoke with um, yeah, just he really got you know got you going, and you know what he said, you you know, listen to everything that he that he had to say. But um, yeah, so he's definitely. He appears in some of my um, structures now that I use, you know, um, locally. And what about some of the other coaches that you had? Do you, as you said, you take some from all of the coaches that you've had. Uh, who are some of the other coaches that you've taken into your coaching? I think you take a little bit from everyone. Yeah. Um, you know, some are mere managers, some are uh, motivational, um, you know, 
Carl Jennings, who was my first ever strength and conditioning coach, and you know the way that he made you, you feel when you ran out onto the field at, at Canberra Stadium or when we played away, he'd be just screaming and yelling. But it was, um, you know, he had just had so much emotion. So you take a little bit from everyone, um, all the coaches that you've had throughout your whole career, and you try and blend them into what you believe. Um, you know, works with others. So, um, yeah, it's, it's such a multicultural, you know, um, teams and players that we have in our competition now, you know, as we see with the, the women's league, it's growing bigger and bigger. So, so many different um, cultures, personalities that you, that you need to deal with. So, you, you've you got to try and um, adapt and, and um, be as flexible as possible as well. And your house partner that day was James Tedesco, usually playing at fullback that is that how's james go as a five eight yeah well he got his hand on hand on the ball a little bit more and yeah another injury i was just coming back from a calf injury and then i rolled my ankle in the first i think seven minutes of the game so i battled on and got strapping over the boot and stuff so teddy probably had to take on a bit more responsibility than he would have would have liked yeah, that's it. Well, what uh, what does it mean to yourself having represented Australia and Italy as well at World Cups at the highest level? Yeah, well, I guess Australia is um, you know where I was born and where I was uh, brought up, and you know very passionate about this country and you know the uh, how lucky we are to live here in you know such a beautiful country and um, yeah, so a little bit different to, to Italy. Um, Italy was representing my grandfather's heritage he moved over here when he was 18 years old and he's the one that set set us up he uh, provided for my my mother and her siblings and gave them the life that they've got to be able to you know pass it on to us so um, what he instilled in into my mum definitely come across to myself they're at every single footy game my nan my grandmother and uh, my mum never missed a game so um, yeah, it was it was about getting out there representing him and his family. I know that um, every time we spoke about Italy and spoke about his family, he'd get very emotional yeah. because uh, he moved over here by himself and, and left his siblings behind. So um, yeah, it's another. They're both different, but both special at the same time. And I think that's a, a that's a special part about the World Cups that we see play because we do have a lot of NRL players that have played for Australia, but uh, some go back and play for their uh, what we call it in not Indigenous, but their heritage uh, yeah. heritage country like uh, Samoa and, and Tonga as well, and it, it sort of mm-hmm. give gets them back to their sort of roots, so to speak. Yeah, definitely. A lot of a lot of players still, um, you know, live by their heritage at home and, you know, um, just their culture, the way that they eat their food and, you know, the way that they look into religion and things like that. So um, I think it's a, a great concept to, to grow the game, um, especially because, um, you know, with, with Italy, I think we take six or seven heritage players, players that are playing domestically over there in Italy and yep. try and put the, the heritage around them to try and um, boost the competition and the interest back back home over there. Yeah, and no, I love the World Cups and seeing all those different nations compete and uh, it's good to see now. Yeah, you're a pretty, you must be a pretty humble man because as we said, t- 2008 was a great season for yourself and in one game you had the opportunity to equal Melbourne Inga's record of 38 points in a game, but you knock back the chance to take the goal kick to equal that record. Why, why did you knock back the goal kick? Oh, I think I was only about 20 games in or 30 games into my NRL career, and he has done everything. And he's, you know, he is Camberatus Mao Meninga. He's got yep. the statue at the front, and uh, he's done everything in the game and won competitions. And um, at the time, we didn't know until. Herbie actually grabbed the ball, and then it was talked about to give give the ball back to me. But um, no one was big mouths. It was, you know, um, you know, would have been, you know, for, for myself, would have been rude to take the the ball back off Herbie to take that last kick to to equal it. But um, yeah, it's it's one that I don't regret yeah. at all. And um, yeah, I'm just um, happy to be spoken about in the same conversation yeah, as, as Mao when it comes to this record. Yeah, well, still, I mean, 36 points is a, is a pretty good record, isn't it? Yeah, well, if I kick the four goals that I miss, I wouldn't have to worry about it, would you? <laughs> no, that's it. That's it, 100%. Um, only the one game for State of Origin for New South Wales, and it was game one down in Melbourne. Um, 
what was your origin experience like, the the camp and also game one? Yeah, it's a little bit different to being on record a few times um, about this is, you know, you hear stories of, you know, the boys bonding and getting together and yeah. um, having a few few drinks to get to know each other and, you know, you hear the old stories of Phil Gould, how he'd say, see you later, boys, see you in two days or whatever it was because yeah. um, that's where he thinks that they got their, their friendship and their bond was off the field. So, um, yeah, we were, because of the actual um, rut that – New South Wales were in Queensland. Were all over them, and they'll—I forget what they were at the time, six or seven in a row series. So there was quite a bit of pressure on the team. So we were out, out in the in the sticks in Melbourne somewhere, where no one knew any anything to do with rugby league, and we're at the hotel room. And then first night in camp, um, after all the introductions and congratulations, and you know, uh, meeting everyone, um, majority of the squad went to bed, and there was only. About eight of us sitting up, and um, I remember at the time Joey Joey John said, "I can't believe there's only eight people here <laughs> on your game one origin night one." So um, yeah, but then it was yeah after that it was, it was quite intense camp. Um, learned a lot actually in that in that you know short amount of time under Craig Bellamy um, and the way that they prepare. So um, I thought I thought it, it helped me. I thought I played. Well, in that game one, I thought my defence defen- defensive game was probably one of the best it's it's ever been, and um, it was just unfortunate in the second half. Michael Jennings was outside me in centre, and he tore his calf, so not many people knew uh, at the time, or um, yeah, still know to date. But um, yeah, didn't really get the ball because your centre's got a torn calf, and he was only yeah. limping around to be out there, so it was, it was quite tough. But you know, it was. Um, yeah, and a little bit different being in Melbourne as well, being on AFL field. So you could hear the crowd, you just couldn't hear the uh, individual niggle that you normally do on a rugby league field. Is that a disappointing thing in your career that you didn't get the opportunity to play another Origin game and perhaps win one and, and, and win a series? Oh, you'd never say, um, you know, never say disappointed. It would have been an awesome opportunity to play more, and um, Suncorp would have been one to stand out. I was there for Joey's return game. I think I played in the residence game beforehand. Yeah. Um, and then just the atmosphere is just um, second to none up there, and you can tell why they're so passionate when it comes this time of year, and they definitely get behind um, their team. So, um, yeah, not disappointed, but just. Um, yeah, it would have been awesome to experience. Well, we see uh, next week, Game 2 in 2023. We've got a couple of debutantes, New South Wales. What what would be your sort of advice for the for the couple of debutantes for New South Wales about State of Origin? Well, hopefully they're having a few few more beers with the rest of the squad tonight. <laughs> what do you reckon? Or last night, whenever they went into camp. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Just enjoy the moment. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, you just never know when it's going to be your last. Like like myself, I've got to you know play one game, which is a, a lot more than a lot of others. But um, yeah, you just um, enjoy each moment and um, yeah, make the most of it. Well, great friend of the show, Hayden Knowles, who's a trainer for uh, New South Wales. He always says that uh, the most connected team is usually the best defensive team, and the best defensive team usually wins the game and wins premierships. So um, hopefully, as you said, they're getting connected and uh, we can get game two victory up there at Suncorp. What was it like playing the my, my team, Parramatta Eels, during your career? What was it like coming up against them? You had a pretty good record down in Canberra against them. Yeah, there was. Oh, there's only really one game that stands out. To be fair, with the the para, like uh, they all become a blur. To be honest, when you finish, but yeah. there was the one game we played against them, uh, Canberra Stadium. I think we we're up twenty six nil after twelve minutes. It was some kind of record. So that one that, that one stands out. I think Glenn Turner was my back row, and we just were on fire that game. So that definitely stands out. But there was a lot of um, a lot of you know close battles over the time. It was always tough. Um, playing them up in Parramatta, but um, yeah, that's that's the one that stands out. Yeah, well, you certainly had a great record against Parramatta down in Canberra. I think it took us uh, it was like twelve years in a row or something before we got a win last year or the year before. So it was always <laughs> tough. But also during your career, you won the Ken Stephen Medal, uh, which is uh, for services, community services outside of rugby league. How special and how big an achievement is that for you to win that medal? Oh, I'm glad you raised it. To be honest, I um, 
don't get to talk about it as much as okay. I'd like. I think it's um, yeah, it's definitely made me um, well the, the the game rugby league has made me the person I am today, and uh, the community services is something that we do a lot of um, in the NRL or even the the girls rugby league now. I see that the Canberra Raiders they're all out in the community. It's it's something that um, yeah I absolutely loved. I cherish getting out talking to to school kids, going to hospital visits. And like, and um, yeah, made me. Um, I loved it so much that I set up my own charity in 2012. Yep. So the Terry Campisi Foundation is still running today. It's um, you know, it's the highlight of, of my week. I love getting uh, and working with these kids that we work with. And yeah, the Ken Stevens Medal was just um, you know, it wasn't it wasn't about myself. It was about everyone's hard work who you know helped me set up Pamela Slocum. Um, is the other director, one of the other directors on the charity who put in hours and hours of time. So this was uh, a massive thank you to, to everyone that uh, was involved. Yeah, now it is a shame that more of the good stuff doesn't get shown in media and on TV and um, you generally see all the bad stuff that happens in rugby league. But um, come grand final day, you do see the Ken Stevens medal being awarded. But... Uh, yeah, it's definitely is more of a highlight should be um, shown throughout the year of the good things that rugby league players do. I mean, a, a lot of players don't like that sort of spotlight. They like to just do it on their own time and by themselves and not get any notoriety notoriety out of doing it. But um, yeah, definitely kudos to yourself for doing that and uh, the other players that, that do that. Your foundation, the Terry Campisi Foundation that you mentioned there, what what is involved in that and, and what, what does the foundation do? It's definitely evolved over time. Uh, started off raising money um, for um, Canteen Cancer here in, in Canberra and then evolved from there to, to other um, charity organisations. So we'll just hold um, yearly golf days and, and charity balls and the money that we raise would go to just local charities and then um, started individuals um, started buying some things that we're hearing in the community that you know for example an individual could um, get a vehicle uh, refurbished for wheelchair access okay. but they couldn't they couldn't get money for the vehicle so uh, would go out and purchase like a little van that they could um, get transformed so they can get the the electric wheelchair into into that vehicle and now um, yeah since coming back in uh, 2017, we started a youth mentor program where we take um, young kids um, for a 20-week mentor program, and then we take them on a on a hike. So, oh, yeah. 2019 was our first one. We took a uh, five young kids to Kokoda. Oh, nice! Yeah. And then, um, obviously, due to COVID, we've been doing Lara Pinta in the Northern Territory, Alice Springs, mm-hmm. and we're back to Kokoda in what three weeks from okay. from yesterday. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, we've got 40. So now we've booked 40 of us we've got eight young kids from Queenman, Canberra, Braidwood and Goulburn we've got two volunteer mentors in each area that meet with them weekly and um, yeah then we uh, go and take on the Kokoda Trail. Oh nice that should be a good uh, good challenge indeed. Massive challenge. Yeah yeah no, <laughs> for sure for sure. Um, how can people donate to the foundation? Yeah just got, got our website so um terrykampisifoundation.org.au um, yep. yeah jump on have a look it shows you all the different events that we've got coming up um, and yeah it shows you the, the different events that we also follow as well and that we support um, our big charity event um, it's only been running for two years it's called the Special Forces Challenge we take um, 25 local identities um, through a 30 hour army um, course yeah, wow. and they raised money um, in the lead up and last year the group raised 350000 so oh, wow. that's, that's an extraordinary effort and the local community gets gets behind it so um, without their um, you know them volunteering their time and putting themselves through um, the 30 hour challenge and we wouldn't be able to take these kids away yeah well we'll put the uh, website up on the show notes and uh, spread the word, no doubt, for sure. You also played over in England for Hay- Hay- Hull KR, Hull Kings and Rovers. Um, first of all, what was that experience like, and were you always wanting to play over in England? 
Yeah, it was it was something I you know, especially when I started um, back in two thousand and three or two. A lot of the players would go to England to play at the end of their career, and yeah, I always wanted to to do it. And I've lived in Queenie my whole life, and <laughs> um, yeah, wanted to to get out and explore the world. So um, yeah, when it when it come time to finish up at the Raiders, the whole car KR gave me a lifeline, and absolutely loved my time. It was only two years, but um, in that two years, um, you know, travelled the world, met some wonderful people. We made the um, Challenge Cup final, which was extraordinary. And um, yeah, I got in a bit of trouble when I first went over there because I said the the fans are uh, yeah the craziest that I've that I've uh, been a part of. <laughs> yeah. um, people back home didn't really like it, but you know you'd get seven thousand to ten thousand people at, at home, and it, it'd feel like the thirty thousand semi final yeah. against the Tigers. So it was just crazy. Yeah, no, for sure they're known for that over there. Their crowds. Was there a uh, Terry Campisi song that they used to sing after scoring a try? <laughs> yeah, there was quite a few. So um, <laughs> yeah, there, there was um, yeah Campisi song. I know Albert Kelly was one of my favourites, and um, yeah, it was it was awesome just to to be in the community and very similar to you know very similar feel to Queenie. To be okay. honest, there was what thirty thousand people. Um, in Hull, and they just absolutely loved uh, rugby league. So it was, yeah. And there was the derby as well, which is. Yeah, what about that? The against... rivalry between uh, Hull FC and Hull KR. What was that like to play in those games? Yeah, I can remember we played a, a trial match there. In my first, um, I don't know, the first couple of months of being there, it was just, I couldn't believe it was trial. They absolutely, <laughs> you know, they got behind it and they were, um, yeah, they were going crazy. There was um, a gap in the in the grandstand so they couldn't get at each other so it was a bit, <laughs> bit full on but yeah one of my greatest memories was um, playing against Hull FC at their home ground and my family had flown over to watch and um, yeah we got a really good victory, scored a try and oh, nice. yeah, it was um, yeah, one, that was my um, highlight of being over there. Is there such a rivalry in the NRL do you think as the one Hull FC versus Hull KR? <laughs> Oh, they're, they're, they're probably there's probably changed over times. You got your Bulldogs, okay. Parramatta, yeah. um, then you got your Anzac Anzac Day games that you know um, you know are, qu- are quite good. But um, yeah, I don't know. That's that's definitely up there. That's definitely up there for one of the the biggest rivalries that you know rugby league has across the world. So um, yeah, it was, it was just awesome to be a part of it. Yeah, no, for sure. Uh, now, since uh, retiring from rugby league, as you said, you've been playing uh, in local leagues. How's that been going? Yeah, awesome. Um, I think, and I would highly recommend for all players to to be involved in the game, some you know way, shape, or form. Um, you know, I think it's good for you, for us mentally. Um, it's good to be still in that team environment. So, yeah, it's only you know a commitment of what two nights or a couple of nights a week and then on the weekend so you still get that football fix and you're still around the around the the club's um environment so yeah absolutely love the my time you know coaching the blues and, and you were captain coach as well is that is that difficult role to do captain coach because you don't see too many like obviously not in nrl but uh probably more so in in bush football and local leagues yeah i think um all the captain coaches out there would be able to would um, be able to understand that it's hard to um, to be on your game all the time and to be um, asking, you know, the best of the players around you. So it was very hard and very difficult. So that's where I, I told you before about being, you know, flexible in the way that you coach. Yeah. That, um, you know, if you played a bad game of football, <laughs> it's hard to go to train and, <laughs> and ex- you know, get up the players yeah, or expect yeah, them definitely. to be... To be um, yeah, so it's, it's it's that fine line when you're actually captain coach of of trying to get the you know actual players to do something that you might not have been doing because you might be struggling to play yourself. So, um, but yeah, it's yeah it's something that, I, that I, I think I grew into and 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 learnt you know over that five five years. And being a former NRL player, is there any uh, like sort of like targeting from from players to get their you know big name, big shot, or something <laughs> like that? Uh, one hundred percent. How do you go with that? Uh, yeah, no, nah, it's, it's fine where I am now down the down the um, down the coast footy. It's not as um, it's not as full on as what it was here in um, in the Canberra competition. It's 
Yeah, it's um, <laughs> it's more more the crowd. It's not so much the players. Okay. It's, more the, it's more the guys on the sideline yeah. who are um, trying to get their dig. Yeah, no worries. And also, most recently, um, you were selected by the New South Wales Labor Party as well in politics to to run for the election for the seat of Monaro. Was politics <laughs> yeah. always on the radar radar for you? And 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 what happened there? Oh, definitely, definitely not on the radar. I um. I joined local council, so I work at the Queen and Palermo Regional Council since um, you know that last World Cup game in 2017. So there's a bit of politics with with local government, but um, yeah, was um, was asked if I'd be interested, and um, you know, being in local council, I deal with um, the federal minister or the, the the local state member as well, and I see the difference that they can make in the community. So you know, at local government level. In the community section where I work, we can, you know, go apply for grants from, you know, one thousand dollars up to a couple of hundred thousand to run projects, uh, projects or programs, and bring some infrastructure to the community. Where at a state level, you can you can make policy change. You can, um, I think, even just in my um, short little stint, there was you know four million dollar pledges um, for local basketball stadiums and yeah. and uh, respite centres and things like that. So it's just that next level of uh, of difference that you can make. So that's why I was yeah definitely interested. Is it something that you might do later on, or oh, you can never box? say. I've definitely ticked it in yeah. a big way. So <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't I didn't expect it to get the media attention that it did get and. Um, yeah, the digging around in the background, which was yeah, just ludicrous, to be honest. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can never say never. Who knows what's what's around the corner? But um, yeah, just I just love working in the community, so that's why you know I'm still working at council, still got my charity, and you know if 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 it is the way I need to make a difference um, on a smaller scale, then that's the way it is. But um, yeah, it's it was definitely unfortunate that you know um, being in a state membership role um or you potentially i guess you couldn't say that i'd get there but um, you can make a, a huge difference that's it and you mentioned community there and last week uh your great mate jared croker played his 300th game for the canberra raiders um what does that what does that mean for like the community because jared's such a big part of the canberra community and playing 300 games is a special milestone yeah, we've all been counting down. We've just been waiting for this for this moment. Um, unfortunately, he's been you know injured the last couple of seasons, but you know he's got the determination and the and the grit to get there, and he's just shown how resilient he is. And um, you know, if anyone can take anything out of what he's achieved in his career, especially all these young kids, is that you, know, you never give up attitude. And yeah, it was just a, a real honour to be there uh, on the night. You know, I got to celebrate with him on Saturday as well with his family and friends. Um, it's such a, a big milestone, and he's such a, gr- a great um, bloke as well. So he's broken nearly every record in the book, and you know, especially at the club and the NRL. So um, this just you know ticks off a, um, another milestone for him, and it's something that I know that he will remember forever. And um, I think, yeah, I think it's just great for the community of, of Canberra and Goulburn, especially where he's from, yep. and um, these young kids can learn a lot from his story. Is there one unique thing that you can tell us about Jared that we probably haven't heard, <laughs> like especially over the last week or two? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> like, there's probably a, a lot that we can't say on this <laughs> podcast, but oh, I, um, the video that I sent, sent Croaks was... The, the memory that sticks out wasn't any of the tries that we were involved in together. None of the games that we won. It was, um, you know, I was radio and at the time on the sideline uh, when they played against South Sydney in that major semi final. And when they won the game, I was meant to be running out there to interview players and I got <laughs> caught up in the motion and I was on the on the ground cuddling the croaks while he had a few tears. So that's the, yeah, the moment that definitely sticks out to me. And uh, I was just, you know, so happy f- as a Raiders fan, and yep. and for him for for all the years that he's he's put into this club, and you know, to make that grand final was a pretty cool moment to be a part, and uh, got to share it with him. And is that something that you're still doing there down there in Canberra on the on the radio on the sidelines? No, I give everything up when I okay. was um, yeah when I when I decided to go for um, 
sort of state role. I um, gave up the Queen Blues and radio and, and some of the other stuff I was doing around just to focus on, on yeah. that because if I was successful, it's, it's full time and I wanted to give everyone enough notice to, to fill those roles. Yeah. So, um, and then, yeah, then it was late that Perts hit me up to go down to Eden. Is that something you want to get back into, but some sideline commentary? Or? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I change my mind every day. I wake <laughs> up and, yeah. um, but I'm a loyal person. If you, yeah, if you look over my career, I stayed at the Raiders. I yeah. wanted to stay at Hull Kingston Rovers, but we got relegated. Um, and um, council have been there what since 2017. So that's six years. It's um, yeah. yeah I, I tend to I tend to stick around and. Um, yeah, fall in love with the places that I'm at. So I don't know if that's good or bad. <laughs> no, that, that, that's fair enough. I'm, I'm in the one job now for uh, what 2018, so 15 years. So yeah, sort of a bit the same. Uh, time for some common league questions. Do you have a favourite game that you played during your career? Is there one that stands out that you just thought, oh, geez, I just love that game. Like that was awesome. Um, yeah, the, well, the Penrith game is probably the one that stands out. You know, the, the 36 points, it was a freezing cold day. Um, down at Canberra Stadium, and when we went out to warm up, we seen Penrith warm up in the shed. So we said, this is, <laughs> we knew straight away. We yep. said, oh, this game's in the in the bag, boys. Okay, um, yeah. But yeah, for that day, it was the, the thing that stands out for myself is I got to share it with the, the, the side, actually. Um, and Trevor Thurlin, who I played my juniors with, so we played at the Blues and played against each other for school and the like. We scored seven tries between us, which is you know pretty. Yeah. It's a pretty special moment to to um, share with someone that you've you know had so much to do with growing up. Would one of those tries that you scored be your favourite try that you scored throughout your career, or is there another one? Nah, there's a uh, yeah. I don't know. I was I was more I more like to set them up. or not okay. Yeah. Too big of a. Um, yeah, don't look into it. I think the a couple against the Dragons were, were always good because we uh, had the wood over them and a lot of my friends are, are Dragon supporters, so I'll just say one against the Dragons just to <laughs> rub it into them. They didn't have a good record down in Canberra either, <laughs> actually, the Dragons. Uh, other than your home ground, Canberra Stadium, did you have a favourite ground that you loved to play at? Oh, I love playing at um, suburban grounds like Hart. Um, yeah, Brookie. You know, places like that, even though we never had, you know, too much of a, a good record at, at those suburban grounds. But, yeah, I don't know. There was just something special about going there and playing, and especially on a Sunday Arvo, yeah, there's nothing definitely. better than the sun shining down and you look at the hill and it's packed and they're just um, they're absolutely giving it to you. <laughs> so, I love, yeah. yeah, that's uh, they're the standout. Probably, I'd probably say like that. Okay. Now, most guests uh, say your home ground is their, their least favourite ground to play at uh what is your least favorite ground to play at um the least favorite ground that's um one i don't really yeah didn't really think about too much um people only hate playing at our ground because it was cold <laughs> yep. the, the surface is absolutely immaculate it's one that you always want to play at but yeah i don't know i think like one of the bigger bigger grounds is either suncorp or um, anz at the time you know, after it had a lot of traffic on it, it was you know just like playing in the in the mud pit, and your, okay. yeah. the ground would fall out from underneath you. So I'd say that only because of um, the state of the the actual um, surface. As a fan, I don't mind going to Canberra because I, I actually live in Penrith, so it gets pretty cold here. Not as cold as Canberra, obviously, but I, my coldest game that I've been to was actually at Leichhardt over one night, so it was colder than Canberra. So there was wind, there was rain, um, I was freezing that night. Um, but, yeah, I've made the road trip down there many a time to uh, watch the Eels play the Raiders. Uh, who was the hardest player to tackle? Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm a person I'd rather tackle big fellas than small. So, yeah, that's yeah, anyone, anyone nippy, no, Preston Campbell, um, the one that, that stands out, you know, um, yeah, Benji Marshall when yeah. he's, um, you know, when he had his footwork going. So yeah, the the little players is the ones that you know. Oh, I didn't like going up against. Yeah, a lot of a lot of uh, former players say that it's the smaller blokes that don't like uh, tackling. They, they um. They they love ta- as you said like tackling the bigger blokes. They seem to be easier. But um, is there a player that you would have liked to have had the opportunity to play with or, or even against during your career? Um, oh, 
play? Yeah, that, this, that's a tough question. Um, yeah, I don't know. Probably Joey Johns. Um, played against him, and I think it might have been his last game against Canberra. Okay. Um, but it would have been, yeah, it would have been awesome to play uh, with him in the halves, um, especially in Origin game because, you know, he just, you know, come in, come in his own. But, um, yeah, he's probably the one that, to stand out that I would have loved to have run out beside. What, what about a player in, in today's game? Is there a player that you'd love to play with? Oh, there's, um, yeah, there's quite, quite a few. Big Latrell would be... Would be um, awesome to play Turbo, Tommy Turbo. He'd make me look really good, I think, um, out on, on the footy field. Reese Walsh, the, the list goes on. I think the talent that's out there at the moment is just um, exceptional. And, you know, I think um, we're very lucky to be spectators of um, some of this talent running around. And what are your thoughts on today's game as to when you self played? What, what are your thoughts on today's NRL? Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I don't mind the um, resets of six um, to, can, you know, to keep the game flowing. I like it how they play the ball instead of, you know, a bit more than, than having scrums and yeah. things like that. So, yeah, I think it, it plays into a more, um, more free-flowing game and a better spectacle. But, um, you know, I know that there's the critics out there as well, so... Um, yeah, I'm happy for the game to just keep, you know, progressing and growing because, you you know, we know how hard it is to compete against the other sports, so we need to, you know, keep looking on how to improve. And have you worked out what a hip drop tackle is yet? <laughs> yeah, it, it is a weird one, the hip drop tackle. Uh, hip, hip drop tackle is even a mouthful to say, but, <laughs> yeah, there's some of them, like, you, you see... Um, they, they're humans. They're going to get yeah. things wrong, but um, yeah, we've got to try and you know, um, I don't know, get rid of it or you know, relook at the rule. Do you think they were around when you were playing and they just weren't policed, and now they are being policed because of injuries? I think they were around. I think um, if you go through some games, you'll see some. Um, I actually haven't haven't seen any for the last couple of um, games that I've watched. No. So you know, people might have already learnt. Um, what not to do? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Uh, who was the prankster at Canberra, the Joker? And what did oh, they do? A few, a few, a few in our time. Joel Monaghan's easily the the one that stands out. Um, yeah, <laughs> he did. What did some, he get up to? Uh, oh, a bit. Of, he, he was always a larrick, and he's the one that um, would pick pick the team up when. Um, yeah, when they're down, obviously after a loss, you can get into a pretty dark place. It's pretty lonely at, at times. Um, yeah, and he's always the one to to uh, pick you up. He'd always either, you know, if we're getting ready to go to gym, he'd get in there early and start doing nude weights or, you know, something like that just to put a smile on the boys' faces. Um, yeah, cause like I said, it gets yeah, quite depressing and, um, yeah, you need players around like that. Yeah, for sure. You need those sort of guys uh, to bring the bring the mood back up. Um, as you said, especially after a loss, it's it's no good. Uh, now, to wrap things up, we've got this set of six questions, the personality questions. Um, outside of probably rugby union, rugby league, what, what's your favourite sport to, to watch or maybe play? Oh, I love all um, American sports. So, NFL, basketball, obviously the championships finished today. So, um, yeah, they're the, the big ones. Anything over there in, in America where they're, um, you know, um, they're pretty pretty big and, you know, there's some unbelievable athletes as well. Who's your NFL and NBA teams? Um, yeah, the NFL is probably the, the 49ers or the um, Chargers. Okay. And NBA, it's it's yeah, still still the old bulls from the Jordan days. Ah, nice, nice selections there. I'm a Forty Niners man and a Chicago Bulls man because of Michael <laughs> Jordan. Grew up watching him as well. Um, what's your favourite holiday destination? Oh, Jesus, so many. Um, yeah, I'd have to say, you know, up. Top in the the lakes district in Italy, it's yeah. Um, yeah, Lake Como and Lake Garda around that area. It's it's um, pretty special, and the food I yeah have a soft spot for Italian food. Um, so I'd have to to say there. So if you haven't been, book your trip right now. Yes, no, boy. Arnie has been over there plenty of times, and that's one of her favourite spots as well. She hasn't seen 
George Clooney yet, because uh, he holidays <laughs> over there plenty of times. Um, well, that actually sort of leads me into the the uh, next question, and it probably would be down the Italian line. But what's your specialty ditch in the kitchen or on the barbecue? Yeah, I fancy myself as a bit of a chef, to be okay. honest. Um, yeah. So pretty much whatever you throw at me, I'll I'll whip up. But um, yeah, I do a a pretty mean veggie lasagna and a meat lasagna. So okay. my go-to is. Um, I normally cook both and, you know, people have a slice of, of each and I, you know, sit there and wait for what they like better. And to be honest, the veggie lasagna is okay. kicking goals. It's yeah. probably it's probably winning by a long long way at the moment. Okay. Yeah, well, unusual. I'd probably go for the meat one, but uh, <laughs> I lo- they're, love... They're both good. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, grew up loving spaghetti and now I'm a pizza man as the favourite. Um, who was the most famous person you'd love to meet? Um, that I'd love to meet. Yeah, yeah and um, have a chat with. Yeah, not too sure. My favourite, you know, probably all-time actor or, you know, in the, um, you know, that kind of level would be Denzel Washington. So yep. love to, yeah, cook him a lasagna. What do you okay. reckon? Okay, yeah, yeah, Show why him not? A, yeah. I reckon he'd be a meat eater too. Yeah. He a, looks like a... Um, yeah, meat eater man, but yeah, I'd love to sit down. He's, you know, his his movies are just exceptional in the way he acts and um, what he's done in his life would be um, pretty awesome to sit down and have a chat. Yeah, he'd have some great stories. What's your favourite Denzel movie? Oh, easily Man on Fire. That's yeah. um, all time. Yeah, he's he's a mean mean man in that. I love yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Which three former Raiders players wouldn't you want to be stuck on a deserted island with, and why? <laughs> oh, deserted island and three. And why? <laughs> yeah, this is hard. I would say Glenn Buttress because whatever food is on that island, it would be gone. He would, <laughs> he would definitely sniff it out and eat it um, before everyone else. Um, probably Ian Hindmarsh. He was okay. Just, Hold yeah, you. yeah. Chuck a little bit of a Parramatta mix in here for you. <laughs> he was, um, yeah, he was, he was one that did. You know, the prankster, but always be pinching or touching you somehow. So it would get quite annoying if there was only three of you on there. Um, and the third, this is a tough one, um, who I wouldn't want to be on there with. Yeah. Probably Alan Tung because he'd okay. make you do burpees and um, <laughs> some fitness. So he'd make you do laps around the around the island. Yeah, okay. <laughs> nah, fair enough. That's the last thing you want to do when you're deserted. Um the last one, favourite musician or band to listen to? Um, yeah, Red Hot Chili Pepper Man. So, okay. yeah, that that was my um, Under the Bridge was my go to song before before a game. So, yeah, yeah. Did you catch them last year when they were out? No, I didn't oh, actually. Year, actually um, I think. Yeah, yeah I haven't. I haven't seen them um, live. So, okay. yeah, I've been to quite a few concerts over my time, but never, never, you know, had the never worked out to be. When the peppers were here, yeah, earlier this year I think they were out. A few people said it was a great concert. Hey, what's your favourite concert that you've been to? Oh, there's been a few. Probably I don't know. You two was um, up in England when we were over over there, oh, yeah. so um, that, was, that was pretty. That was pretty good. Yeah, no, great band. I've seen them a couple of times here in Sydney. Well, Terry Campisi, thank you very much for joining me today on the Paracave podcast. I really enjoyed it. Uh, there were some great stories there, reminiscing about your career and a few laughs as well. So next time I'm down in Canberra, uh, might see you at a Parramatta Canberra game. So thank you very much for coming on the Paracave podcast today. Yes, thanks for having us. And, um, yeah, go the Raiders. <laughs> <laughs> Well, welcome back, and thanks for listening to Terry and his rugby league story. There were some great yarns in there, some great stories, a few laughs as well. Uh, Terry's doing some great things with his foundation, the Terry Campisi Foundation, and I will put the link to the foundation in the show notes. So if you want to donate to the foundation, then just check out the show notes and it'll be in there. And uh, keep up the great work, Terry, and have fun on the Kokoda track, which you said you were doing in a few weeks as well. So uh, good luck with that one. I hope it goes well for you and the hikers as well. 
Now, uh, once again, a quick shout out to the sponsors of the podcast, the major sponsor, Jack's Pale Ale, uh, for supporting the podcast. Uh, Jack's Pale Ale is back and available to purchase in the club shop. Perfect for that Eels fan or beer lover as well. So drop into Parramatta Leagues Club in the club shop and you'll be able to get your Jack's Pale Ale. Bo Cook from Loan Market. His contact number is 0401 213236. Get in contact with him for a free chat and see how he and his team can help you get on top of your home loan and find you that best deal. And congratulations to Bo and his team for being nominated in some uh, mortgage broker awards just recently. Didn't win, but great to be nominated as well. Keep up the great work. Scott from Brightside Detailing and Ceramics. You can contact him on 0449 544 086 and let him know that you heard it here on the Paracave podcast and you'll be driving around in the shiniest and cleanest car in town. BTZD Teamwear, the official apparel sponsor of the podcast. You'll see me in my uh, BTZD polos. Um, They've got a great range of team sportswear as well, so head to their website and see what they can do for you. www.btzd.com.au Shannon Cooney from Glenmore Park Realty. Get in contact with Shannon He is a five-star real estate agent in the Glenmore Park and the Penrith LGA area. So if you want that five-star service, then contact Shannon today or any day on 0421588445. Please support these businesses that support the podcast that help bring you quality entertainment each week. And also share the love on socials as well. Now, before the chat with Terry, I mentioned how you can get your hands on some Paracave podcast merchandise. Well, the as I said, BTZD clothing. They have I have a couple of polo shirts, Paracave podcast polo shirts that are available. Uh, I think I have one XL and two large shirts left. So for only thirty dollars, you can get your hands on those. Just send me a message on socials, uh, and we'll organise getting that one to you and payment as well. So thirty dollars each for the polos or a plus postage and handling or you can also get a paracave podcast hat that you'll see me in videos and pictures and the like uh, for the reasonable price of only fifteen dollars each which comes with the new exciting podcast logo once again All you need to do is just message me on socials and if I'm at a game and you're at a game at Combank, um, let me know. You'll save on the postage and handling. I'll bring it with me. Um, But $15 plus postage and handling if you need it posted. Uh, Just head to any of the social media channels, the Paracave Podcast social media channels. Send me a message and we'll once again get that organized for you as well. Uh, they look great. I wear them all the time. Uh, very happy with them. So thank you very much, BTZD. And the hats look great as well. Perfect for when you're out in that uh, winter's walk. Now, uh, coming up next week on the podcast, there will hopefully be a game day preview of State of Origin game number two. Hopefully for my celebrity guest as well Uh, that's next week game two of the series is coming up so uh, hopefully we'll get say maybe a Queenslander this time around for a game day preview we had Greg Bird for from New South Wales on game number one so maybe a Queenslander for game number two just to uh, you know share it around share the love around and you know the game is up in Queensland so uh, hopefully I can get a Queenslander on board for that one. Uh, a 
game day preview might come out for the Eels v Sea Eagles game, so stay tuned for that one as well. Of course, I've got my tipping video uh, podcast which is out at the moment, so have a listen to that one and see if you agree with my tips or if you are different to my tips, let me know which ones are different um, and we'll see how we go. As I said, I got five out of eight last week. I'm hoping to get five out of five in a shortened round this week because of Origin. So, um, yeah, have a listen to that one. Tell me your thoughts. Let me know. I hope you're enjoying this content out on the Paracave podcast. Uh, I really enjoy doing it, and I love presenting all this stuff to you. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you to you, the listeners. Uh, Once again, thank you very much to Terry Campisi for his time. There will be a a YouTube video of the interview coming out soon on the YouTube channel. Um, And also the Greg Bird interview will also be coming up soon on the YouTube channel as well will um so if you've missed it the audio which is there if you've missed the audio and you prefer to watch watch the video watch the conversation then it'll be up there sometime soon so keep your eyes out for that one and also keep your eyes open on the social media channels for that one as well some exciting guests coming up as well in the future so stay tuned have a great week as best you can and uh, I will talk to you guys before Origin, so enjoy the footy this weekend. I hope if your team's playing, they win. I hope Parramatta get up as well. Um, but yeah, follow the podcast on the social media channels for interesting content and to see who's coming up, both on Instagram and Facebook as well. But to sign off the show, as I always say, the Paracave podcast, by the fan, for the fans. Go para! Thank you for listening to another episode of the Paracay Podcast. See you next time.